it's all very well interviewing these people who aren't famous, but when we're going out to the whole world on television, which we will eventually, we've got to have really internationally famous people being interviewed. And before we actually film, of course, we'll have got their relations in to have a chat with their, them as well. So it'll all be documented as well. And that will come in time. Um, what I'm pushing, and all my colleagues on the scientific side are pushing, is that we've got the experimental proof of survival, and we now know where the next world is. But understandably, everybody wants to know much more than that. And I'm quite prepared to answer the questions. But as long as you realise this is hearsay now, because when somebody materialises at our experiment, the exciting thing is that they're there, proving their survival. But as you can imagine, we're firing the questions at them. What's it like in the next world and all this? So when they answer those questions, you realise we're now on to hearsay. I'm quite prepared to wait until I get into the next world to find out whether the hearsay is correct. For example, I'm a very keen on sport, cricket, rugby and golf. The first thing I ask, of course, is do we play our sport in the next world? And they say, whatever makes you think that we don't play sport. It's all so natural and normal. Of course you play sport over here. So that's another aspect of it. Then a lot of people want to know about reincarnation because through mental mediumship you're getting a conflicting story coming back from the next world. Some people in the next world are saying, yes, we do have to keep coming back to Earth but to learn lessons and develop our characters. Then other people are saying, no, we don't know. So I thought I'd ask one of the materialized figures and get it straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. I said, uh, do we actually ha have reincarnation? Do you have to come back onto Earth? And this chap said, I'm sorry, I, I don't know. Now that's natural. He said, you see, you don't die and get the secrets of the universe. He says, honestly, I don't know whether I've got to come back. Um, if I have, then probably I'll just find myself back there. When people materialise, like that little boy materialised at nine years old, he died of cancer nine years ago, and he says, Mike, we have totally different laws of physics over here. We've still got laws of physics, but the different speeds they operate at, the, the different laws come into effect. And he says, even though I, um, I died nine years, uh, 20 years ago at the age of nine, this is how I'm coming back. We can change our etheric bodies. You can't change your physical body, you're locked into that, but as soon as you break from the physical body, you can change it. So I'm coming back now as the nine-year-old boy my parents lost, and when they die, that's how I'll rush up to them as the nine-year-old boy they lost. But when you're over here for a while, you'll find everybody operates in their prime. 25-year-olds in perfect health. They don't have any disease at all in the next world. Disease is purely of this physical world. They don't have any mental defectives. Mental defectives is a damaged brain on earth. It's just that the, uh, the mind hasn't got a, a perfect instrument to work through. So they've got different laws of physics in the world, in the next world, and they can change their etheric bodies to be young or old. If only we've been following philosophers like Thomas Paine, the world is my country. To do good is my religion. If we'd been following these boys, philosophers, instead of priests, we wouldn't have had all this killing. You see, people weren't born hating each other in Northern Ireland or in Bosnia. They were taught to hate by priests and their parents who were victims of priestcraft. You won't have this problem if you follow philosophers. People will start to behave themselves much better. So it is important to take notice of the hearsay, uh, um, especially that we're liable for our actions. I'm sure everybody agrees with this. They, they do on my lectures, they seem to like that side of it. And all the broadcasts I've done, I've had a marvellous feedback on this, making sure everybody watches their step. I watch my step now. As a young man, like every other, most young people, you spend a great deal of your time overriding your conscience. When you're young, you want to do something, and your conscience says, no, don't do that, that's not right. You say, ah, sod it, I'm going to do it anyway, and you do it. But as you're getting on a bit, and you find out about survival like I have, I, I don't override my conscience so much as I used to. I start to take notice of my conscience. It's, everybody's got it there. It's whether you take notice of it or not. But this is the other great philosopher I want everybody to follow, is uh, Arthur Finlay. He wrote this wonderful history of mankind uh, during the last war. And my mother named me after Arthur Finlay. My middle name's Finlay, Michael Finlay Roll. And when you think of it, the last philosopher should be the greatest philosopher because he's armed with all the work of his predecessors. His great hero is Thomas Paine, you see. So he's just carried on where Thomas Paine left off. 
uh, Thomas Paine wrote The Age of Reason in uh, 1794, exactly 200 years ago this year. And uh, Finlay died in the 1960s, but what he's left us in a legacy, these wonderful books. So if we carry on following the line of philosophers to follow is Pythagoras, Socrates and Plato, the ancient philosophers, because they all said the same as um, Finlay and Paine, that we all survive death. There's a vast universe out there you can't see and sense. These are boys 2,600 years ago saying that, you see. And that's what Paine was saying in the 1790s. Don't listen to the priest. All love one another and be together and uh, don't hate. And then if we come down to Arthur Finley, the last great philosopher, saying exactly the same thing and putting it all together, you see. So are these books readily uh, attainable? Yes, it's taken me 14 years to get The Curse of Ignorance republished, and we've now got it republished and it's available. And uh, on, the, on the cover of this um, uh, video we're doing will be how to get hold of these books because you can send free of charge to my pamphlet uh, written by Snyder. And on the back of the Snyder pamphlet is how to get hold of these books. So everybody can do their own research and uh, f have the same knowledge as I have. You've only got to read about four or five books. They're books that the establishment are praying with all their might that the people never come across. But once they do, then they'll be armed with some marvellous information. Here's a little gem as well. This is um, published by the Royal Television Society, the memoirs of John Logie Baird, the pioneer of television. You ought to see what he says in here about survival after death. He actually invented the infrared camera, which we should be using to record the materialization phenomena. And Baird in here is a picture of him w working with Sir Oliver Lodge on the infrared camera. And in the text here, he says that uh, one of his colleagues, uh, a professor 